rapid pace out here early in the second. Levert, he knocks it down. Gentlemen, boys and girls, gentlemen, welcome to episode number 44 of the All Things Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. As always, Brandon Lewis, Joey Snyder with you. What's going on, Brandon? We got it. It's a, it, It's almost here. October 19th, the first game for the Cleveland Cavaliers. That is the uh, the first game of the regular season, not the preseason, because I know you hate preseason and summer league and anything that has to do with the outside of actual games. Man, can you believe that? We, you know, I'm so excited. I cannot wait for the start of the season. Brandon, first game away, October 19th, and it is against the Toronto Raptors. I, I got some thoughts. On this game, we're going to talk about uh, the, the, the first the first couple of games of the season because there's some there's some good ones in here. Uh, I'm going to start on this because I, I like this matchup. They are t- the Cavs and the Raptors to me are two very similar teams. I completely agree. They're 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 young. They got some vets. They. They just match up well. You got the narrative of, you know, the rookie of the year, Scott, you know, Scotty Barnes against the runner up Evan Mobley is the chip going to be on Evan Mobley's shoulder Uh, is, you know, how much work has he put in, which we will get into later as well, but this is just, it's, it's a good matchup. I think it's going to be a good start to the season. And I think it's going to set the tone in a lot of ways as well, because I think that uh, the other Raptors are a tough team. They were what fourth or fifth seed last year, Mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, it's, you know, Gonna be a very, very competitive game. I, both teams are gonna want this first win. Yeah, of course they skyrocketed in March because you are the Cavs and Raptors. We, how many times did we talk about it in the middle of the season? That big March six game that was fucks to ESPN on your birthday, by the way, which the Cavs ended up pulling a victory out out of. And at that time, you know, we said it was a huge game because. If I recall, the Cavs were a game up on Toronto at the time, and if they won because they owned the tiebreaker, they would have been three games up and had and had we have lost, they would have been tied with Toronto, and Toronto would have overtaken that spot. So the Cavs have played Toronto very well, though I completely agree with you that Toronto matches up really well with the Cavs. Obviously, we all know you got the narrative with with Scotty Barnes, the rookie of. Of, of the year, and of course yourself, me, and a lot of Cavs fans think that Evan Mobley was snubbed of the rookie of the year. There's been so many reports of Mobley, you know, again, we'll, we'll get into this a little later. There's been so many reports of Mobley working on his game this summer. And yeah, you know, I think it's a it's a good, interesting first test. Um, now, I will say, no matter the result of the game, no matter if the Cavs blow them out, no matter if Toronto blows out, no matter if it's a really close game, either way, I think, again, as I mentioned last week, you know, with preseason, with this Cavs roster the way it is right now, with how deep they are, I'm really interested to see how the rotation is. I think specifically for these first couple of games and with a team like Toronto that has a bunch of versatility that can match up a lot with, with what the Cavs do. And I think it's going to be highly competitive and – the good thing for the Cavs is they get a couple days off after because I think this this game could be, in, in, in a way, a tone setter. I think you could be right on that, but it is also the first game of the season. Yeah, I mean, both teams are going to be – are coming in. And I, I think the one thing the Cavs are going to have that's working against them is they still have to try to figure out that starting rotation. Whereas I think, I think Toronto is going to pretty much be locked and loaded and know what they're going to be doing uh, as far as rotation goes. So, but I don't, I don't think the, the, I don't think Toronto is a better team. I think the Cavs are probably, I think the Cavs and Toronto are, like I said, are pretty equal. Uh, But 
I think, you know, it could just come down to coaching at that point. Um, or, you know, I mean, you know, and we've been wrong in the past. It might be a complete blowout. The Cavs went 110 to 70. Uh, but I do, I, you know, this, the, the game after, like you said, they got a couple days after Toronto. And then they're on the road again in Chicago. Like, <clears throat> that is a tough back, not, you know, not back, yeah. not back to back in a row, but back to back games. Um, especially away. You got two teams who, you know, I think, you know, I think the Bulls are going to be right there in the playoffs as well. Um, so that, that's a tough start. And that, you know, depending on how healthy Chicago is, because yeah. that's, if they're a hundred percent, that's a dangerous team. DeRozan, uh, Levine, um, Vucevic, Lonzo, a lot of a lot of good players on that team, you know, either all stars or former all stars. You know, everyone can say what they want about DeRozan. He might be getting a little bit older, but he can still. He's got. He may have one of the best jump shots in all of the NBA. Yeah, I mean, at, at at one point, I know there was you know national talk about DeRozan being a dark horse MVP candidate last yeah. year. When when now, obviously, at the end of the year, Chicago fell. Fell off a little bit, you know. They they got one game on on Milwaukee, I believe, uh, in the first round. Most of those games weren't really competitive. Um, you, you know, the Bulls always play the Cavs tough, especially in Chicago. Chicago seems like an, another one of those Miami like places where the Cavs just struggle in. However, saying that, like, I think the Cavs are a little better than the Bulls as 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 we currently speak. I think Chicago. A little bit was I thought that they were better last year and then they kind of fell off at 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 the end of the year. So this year with Chicago, I'm not as high on Chicago, I guess, as I was last year. I think especially with with the the, the better you know competition in the East and the Cavs being included in that. I think Chicago, you know, I think they'll they'll obviously I think be a great candidate for a seven eight seed playing tournament, but I think that they take a little bit of a step back, and you know we'll see. But I agree with you. I think that that's a tough one for the Cavs, but hopefully that they are motivated because the home opener then is the next night against Charlotte. Yeah, and you know the other thing that I want to um, I want to point out is. The Bulls have good young pieces too. Yeah, that is a good point. So you know they have Patrick Williams, who was hurt a lot last year, uh, as well as I can't pronounce his name, but you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, Caruso still there? I, I I believe. I think Caruso's still there. So they, I mean, they got bench pieces. They got good young pieces in addition to their core. Yeah. Uh, you know, which is you know chock full of ridiculous talent. So I think that, you know, if if they I, that team might kind of look like a older. I look at them like an older version of the Celtics, where okay. their core is older than the Celtics, but they still have really good young pieces that have that are, that are going to emerge throughout the season and supplement that core. Where do you see – why am I not seeing the next game is uh, Charlotte? Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's it's, it's Washington. That's there my we bad. Yeah, That's I was my like bad. – I'm like, Brandon, come on. You're, is, you're the one that's supposed that to be is, on top of this that stuff. That is my bad. I, I, don't, I was thinking the, the Washington – I don't know why the Washington – I don't know why. I got all messed the up. Washi- my apologies. The, the, the Washington Hornets. The Washington Hornets, <laughs> yeah. The Washington Wizards. Uh, that that is a home game. That is a Sunday at seven o'clock at night, which to me is just weird for, for a home opener. It's also really weird. I don't know why. Yeah, but look, look at the rest of the games. I mean, the first game seven thirty, eight o'clock against the Bulls, seven o'clock against. I mean, almost all the games are always seven o'clock at night. Yeah, but I mean, on a Sunday home opener during the football season. I don't get why the NBA does this. Like, I don't yeah. know if, I don't know why, why they think that, you know, I know like I, I, I looked it up as a matter of fact, that, that will be week seven for the Browns. So they'll, they'll, they'll be at Baltimore. It's a, it, it's a one o'clock game. Game will be over in plenty of time for, for the Cavs game. But like outside of your like local market, especially during the, the height of the football season, I don't know why the NBA schedules a lot of these games on Sundays. Maybe they have to just based off the, the, 
that 82 game schedule and you kind of have to go every other day. I mean, I get it, but the really, if you look at the cap schedule, the first month of the season, all of those Novembers, all those Sundays, they do have a Sunday game. Now, luckily for the Cavs, when they are away, the Browns are at home. When the Browns are away, the Cavs are at home. So there's going to be no conflicting traffic for the people going downtown. But that is one thing that I noticed this year a lot was the Cavs are playing, you know, almost every other day. There's a lot of Mondays, a lot of Wednesdays, a lot of Fridays, a lot of Sundays in there. And so I don't know if it was designed as like, hey, you know, the Cavs are a better team now. We're going to get them kind of more not. I know they have nine prime time games this year, but just more night exposure in general for people that are general fans of, of the league. But I just don't recall at the top of my head a home opener being on a Sunday night in basically the middle of the football scene. It just seems so weird to me. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. It's You know how it is. I mean, the NBA is going to try to make their money. The NFL is going to try to make their money. And I don't really think they care, you know, to, to be honest. They know that, you know, a team like the Cavs is going to pull in, uh, you know, the, the Cleveland fans are loyal. I mean, the, we, we were we were packing the rock yeah. while when we didn't even know if the Cavs were going to be good last year. Almost, you know, most of the games were sold out. And then once they became good, that place was rocking every single night. So... <clears throat> You know, the NBA knows they'll make their money. The NFL knows they'll make theirs. I think that it's I, – I think that, you know, after two rough – you know, two tough games, um, you, you, they're, they're, they're giving us the Wizards uh, as the home yeah. opener, which to me is a win. I Unless Bradley Beal goes for uh, 100, 101 points, yeah. uh, I think that's a win. Next up, you got the Magic at home after that on the 26th. I think that, you know, obviously that's a win. Um, you know, anything can happen, but I'm just going by what I think. But then, then you got the Boston Celtics, and that's going to be a really rough game. I think that's going to be maybe their first test against a team that is a legitimate. I mean, that is. I, I think that's their first. I guess first test against a legitimate NBA championship team, um, you know, contender. Uh it's yeah. one. It, it's a way, and I'm excited to see it because I think that that's going to be. You know, we're going to see a lot of teams this year. A lot of teams are good, but you're you're talking about a team who is still young, didn't lose any players. Uh, they're going to have Robert, Robert Williams is going to be healthy, who was a huge impact player last year for them. Young, uh, same with, you know, they're going to have a lot of those players that were on the rise last year, have another year under their belt, you know, training in the offseason. The Celtics are going to be a very, very, very good team uh, this this year, and that's going to be, to me, their first tens, test against a team who I believe can win the NBA championship. Yeah, I think the biggest question in terms of Boston is how does Boston come out? You know, do they come out like a team that is angry, that is wanting to prove that that they, you know, took the the eventual champion Golden State to six games last year? Or do they come out of the team that is, you know, a little bit of an NBA Finals hangover, and maybe that is a chance for the Cavs to, to catch them? Now, they also added uh, Malcolm Brogdon from uh, Indiana. So that's, that, another, no, that's right. That's, yeah. That's, that's another piece. So they are deep. <sighs> You know, who knows, too? Maybe they call Brooklyn and cook something up for a Kevin Durant, though I doubt it. But I doubt it because they don't need it because that's Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Marcus Smart. You just said Malcolm Brogdon. They 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 brought in who is a phenomenal point guard slash shooting guard. You can put him at you know, either or. He's a very team oriented player. I mean, Malcolm Brogdon is very much like a Marcus Smart to me. Yeah, both both about the team. Uh, I, Brogdon, I think, could put up. Uh, a little bit of higher numbers, you know, if you wanted to, but, you know, Smart's right there with them. You got Grant Williams, who emerged last year. Robert Williams, you know, was looking like one of the best centers in the NBA uh, as far as, you know, blocking shots and, and grabbing boards. And he's, you know, he was hurt a lot of last year, and he was still doing some some superhuman type stuff. I think they're, you know, they're young. They're I think they're going to come out hungry, and they're going to definitely show the league that they deserve to be there last year. They're going to do it again this year. The question is, you know, what other young, hungry teams are there out there? Yeah. And like I, I said, we're, we're, we're not going to go through the entire uh, the entire schedule. I'm sorry. What were we, we going to say? Well, and I, 
And I was going to say, too, that the Cavs are going to be one of those other hungry teams. Exactly. And it's going to be interesting because they do play Boston after that. That would be five days later in Cleveland at the Fieldhouse. So, Mm -hmm. you know, home and home there with Boston. And then we do not see them again until – let me make sure I get the date right here because I already screwed it up once. November 13th. Well, we don't – well, yeah, I know November 3rd. We'll want to see here. So November 2nd is a home game with Boston. And then we don't right. see them again until March 1st. Oh, oh, you're talking about the Celtics. Okay. The Celtics, yeah. I thought you were talking about a home game. I oh. was like, wait, what? No, 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 I'm not <laughs> the Celtics. No. So March, so yeah, so we go from November to March, then we play them again in March, where we will go at Boston and then again versus Boston in that kind of way home in that five game period. So that's that'll be a very interesting early matchup and then a very interesting late matchup to see how both teams kind of progress throughout the season. So yeah, I I agree with you hundred percent. It's going to be, you know, this team, I, you know, they're just, I think that both teams are going to get better. I think, you know, it's kind of like, you know, a lot of teams, if they get hit with the injury bug, you know, you're going to see what's going to happen. Uh, if, you know, if they don't, they're just going to continue to get better and better and better. But, you know, we're not going to try to go through the whole schedule, but I will say November 6th, November 7th, which is the ninth and 10th games of the year, November 6th, we play the Los Angeles Lakers away. Uh, Cavs versus LeBron. Is AD going to be healthy? You know, I think LeBron just signed that two-year contract, 90 plus million dollars. Mm-hmm. Uh, is Westbrook still going to be terrible or is he going to get his act together? Is he even going to be on the Lakers at that point? I, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that yeah. they've, I think they had like some big meeting and kind of tried to get all on the same page. Um, and then the, the next night on the seventh, we play the Clippers. Is Kawhi going to be healthy? Exactly. You got and if he is, you got Kawhi, Paul George, Norman Powell, uh, Robert Covington. That was you know the, Norman Powell, Robert Covington. I mean, to, and, and and Paul George brought him to the playoffs. Yeah. Now you add in you know Kawhi Leonard, who you know we know he's been injured uh all, you know all of last year, but you know if he comes back and plays at Kawhi Leonard levels. Uh, it's going to be a very dangerous team as well. So that's going to be, those are going to be fun games to watch Lakers and Clippers and uh, you know, pretty much all 82 games of the year. We cannot wait for, we finally get to talk about basketball, but uh, I do want to switch gears here just a little bit, Brandon. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this, uh, but we have to, it's our obligation. It's written in our contracts, actually hashtag Sexton watch uh, still no movement. No one knows. <laughs> Apparently, he hasn't signed his qualifying offer. He's he hasn't signed. I don't. I don't think the Cavs are looking to trade him uh, as of right as of right now. I don't. I don't know what the situation is. I wish that there was any sort of transparency into you know. I think the Cavs are just like you know play on it. Don't whatever you know. We like 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 you said last week. There's so many spots on the team, and we have no idea. <laughs> How we're, you know who's going to make it, who's not, and if you want one of them, it's yours. And if you don't, we have someone to replace you. Um, but your your thoughts, real quick, because I I can't I cannot spend too much time. I yeah, sex this I, mean, week. <laughs> I, I I think Joey, I think we're going to have an, another month, and I think by the start of uh, training camp in in late September, uh, I think that, that we should have a decision because I think Sexton should want to be involved in training camp and. You know, I think in order to be fair to the Cavs, they can make some of these roster decisions. Um, But at this point, I think it is a little bit safe to say that they are, question mark, planning on having Sexton on the team for the 2022-23 season. Uh, That is written in white pencil that can easily be erased (laughs) if, if something happens before then. But again, it's like, if, if you're Sexton, let's say you don't sign the contract before training camp begins. If these guys get into practice and they see, you, you know, Revert, let's say, bowing out or a Coral bowing out or a Baji or one of these guys that we think could potentially take either the two or, or, or the three. Well, if Sexton comes back, is, is there going to be – the only thing I can think of is, like, is there going to be a divide between – Sexton being like, hey, 
you guys paid me to start. I need to start. And the coaching staff saying like, no, you are going to come off the bench because we feel this is the best for the team. Is, is that the impasse, do we think? I think that that might be probably the biggest the biggest thing for Colin Sexton's trepidation into signing anything is that he has no idea how the Cavaliers are going to use him. Because I don't think that they even know. So if they say we want you to come off the bench, then he's going to be coming off the bench. And if you know he starts, he starts. But if he's going to be playing on this qualifying offer, he's playing for his next contract. And if he's coming off the bench, he's not going to get that hundred million dollars that he's looking for. You know that five year, twenty million dollar year offer. The Cavs are going to use him in the way that they see that they feel best will will help this team win games. Now, if that is starting. That will help him. If that's coming off the bench, then he's probably going to have some issues with it. And I mean, but he doesn't really have a choice. I mean, honestly, I you know, I, I do feel bad for Colin Sexton. He's kind of in a situation that he has been working his ass off to get back to the NBA. And if you have seen him, his, his workouts, he is as explosive as I have seen him or anybody else coming off of uh, a, a knee injury like that he is you know last year he showed that his that he is tenacious on defense he was working on his defense he showed his explosiveness he showed that he was a team player and I'm not saying I would give him 20 million dollars a year because the Cavs can't do that we also have to you know people are like well you know if he's worth it, well, we're giving 20 million to Jared Allen, who is an all-star. Yeah. We just gave Darius Garland, who is also an all-star. And we've like, we've talked about, you know, a potential star, maybe a superstar down the road. We gave him a max contract and we have Evan Mobley coming up in four years and not to mention. I'll, you know, all these other guys we have on the team, you know, are we going to resign Kevin Love next year? You know, is he going to be trade bait? Are we going to, you know, Lavert, is he going to get an offer? Like you said, there's a lot of guys who can ball out and we don't know who that's going to be. So I think that this is, it's just, it's a bad situation for Colin Sexton to be on a team that is this deep. We, you know, me and you talked a lot, especially in the early episodes. So if you guys haven't checked them out, check out every episode we put out, all 45 of them. <laughs> 44. This would be 44. I'm sorry, 44. Check out the previous 43 episodes. Um, Because we have said, you know, Colin Sexton was putting up monster points, but he was the best player on the worst team. Those points had to come from somebody, and he just was the best player on the worst team in the league, one of the worst teams in the league. Now he's on a team where there's a lot of good players. There's a lot, not only a lot of good players, a lot of good young players. So now – He's not the go-to guy. You got Garland who surpassed him. You got Mobley who's probably who who, who I in my mind has surpassed him. Yeah. You got Jared, Jared Allen who is as solid as they come. You got Agbaji who's you know coming in rookie has Lavert up to his game. You know, and we can go on and on yeah. and on. You know, Kevin Love coming off the bench might yes. be it might have a bigger impact yeah. than and and then when Rubio comes back, I think he, he might have a bigger impact. The best thing I think the Cavs can do. <clears throat> Is is try is is honest to try and trade Sexton, and I didn't, and, and it's not because I feel any other any other way than I can't see Sexton fitting on this team right now. And people can you you can rip me all you want, but I think deep down you know I am right. Sexton is a great player. I think Sexton could be an All Star but I don't think Sexton is going to fit on this team. Garland is a better version of Sexton. In my opinion, the, the, the Damian Lillard CJ McCollum experiment did not work in Portland. Why would it work in Cleveland? You have Garland who is one of the best point guards in the league and has not gotten anything but praise from anybody this entire offseason. Everyone has just been saying how much better he is now than he was last year or how much uh, how much he's improving. He is going to be an absolute stud this year. You have Evan Mobley, who has been putting in crazy amounts of work with the best of the best 
to make him to make himself take that you know that huge step like he's i think he's going to skip he's going to make the all-star team this year i think but i think he's going to even jump that and become a superstar this year too i mean he's doing backflips in the sand on instagram just because he can and you know this this, this kid is going to be a generational talent i said it again as i've said every episode and i'll continue to do so until he proves me wrong you got an but me and you've talked about what we feel when he's at his best one of the top three centers in the east and jared allen sexton doesn't fit on this team there's no room for him to become the player that he needs to become but he has a lot of value I think if you package him, you could probably package Jetty with him. And I know there has been a lot of reports that the Cavs have tried to package Jetty with something this offseason, but it just the deals just weren't they were they weren't the right deals. And I, I think you could, you know, maybe get a first round pick, you know, like a you know, someone might give you a late, a late first round pick and maybe a veteran player. You know, I think the best thing if for everyone is to move on, let Colin go to a team where he can be his best and open up that roster spot for a younger player for us. I don't know how long you just spent. I don't know that. I don't know if that was two or three minutes, <laughs> but I sat here and just listened to every single word you said. I barely interrupted you. And there's a reason why I did that. First of all, that, that was one of the cleanest, most clear takes I have ever heard from either one of us since we began together. And you pretty much repeated what I had been telling you since about February when we had the discussion of the trade deadline and the Cavs didn't make any moves. And then we went into the draft and I was the one sitting here saying, you cannot have sex in. And whoever at the time was the first round pick, which ended up being Abaji and Levert and Okoro, all on the same team. I said mathematically, just roster perspective-wise, it did not work. Somebody is not going to get a lot of minutes out of those four. It just doesn't work the way there's only five players on the court. There's only 48 minutes in a ball game at a time. And it's unfortunate. It, it really is it's unfortunate for Sexton because you're right. He was playing well when he got hurt last year. You have been trying to tell me all along, as I, I have said that I didn't think the Garland and Sex experiment worked from, from the start. You had told me that that you think, you know, it, it it could work because we saw it. They were seven and four. I know, you know, or yeah, I believe seven and four, 11 game sample size when Sexton was hurt last year and the Cavs were winning. And yes, Sexton was on the worst team when he was scoring all those points, all of the above, I concur. I, I think at this point, it is becoming a headache. It's becoming a headache mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. It's becoming a headache for the Cavs. Heck, I'm sure it's even becoming a headache for Sexton, but maybe it's not because I would think that with camp, you know, just about a month away here, like it feels like there's no other team willing to offer him. So maybe he's waiting till a team comes up with a sign and trade for the Cavs. Maybe he just sign sign the offer and the Cavs trade him right away. Though I don't even know if you can do that. There might be a thirty day waiting period on that. I'm not even sure about that. So there there's a lot going on here, and it it almost feels like it's either going to come out of the blue. Where it's just going to be like one day, oh yeah, by the way, Colin Sexton has signed a small by all he's here at camp and everything's good and all, all rosy and no one's going to understand why. Or, like I said, my biggest fear, and I said this last week and it's worth repeating, my biggest fear is this carries over into camp, into preseason, and even quite possibly the regular season. And I don't want it being a distraction on the team. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100. percent And it's 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 not that I ever disagreed with any of your points because you know I just try to put everything in the one. My biggest thing was I always held out hope that Sexton and Garland could work together, and I think that I, I do think that there there is always that possibility it could. But you on this team, and as you pointed out, and as you pointed out many times, you know, since the draft. You got a lot of very similar players on the team. 
you got a lot of shooting guards on this team. And we've, we both talked about this and, you know, our, our man, you know, Clarence from the Denver dogs, when, when we did the, uh, the draft special, he said this, he wanted a six, eight wing, yeah. which is exactly what the Cavs do need. But is there a trade out there to get one? I don't think so. And as much as I do like Sexton, you don't believe that he's as good as I think he is. That's where That's we differ. Point. Yes. I Correct. think he's, a, I think he's much better than you, than you think he is. So I think that there is a team out there with a needed shooting guard and that will allow Sexton to grow into a potential all-star. I don't think he's, he can grow to that level on the Cleveland Cavaliers. And I agree with that. There is no team, especially if there's no team in today's NBA, unless it was, you know, the team, uh, you know, like the, the super teams that were put together where the players all got together and said, let's all go to the same team. No team's going to have five all-stars on their team. The Cleveland Cavaliers potentially are going to have three this year in which, Mobley, Allen, and Garland. Which for most teams now is the most. Exactly. I mean, I can't, I cannot, I can't see a fourth unless, and this is my our next topic, because I got I gotta tell you, we don't got we don't got a lot a lot, a lot of time left, but I do want to get into one more topic. Sure. We, we we've talked about Darius Garland working out and everyone giving him a ton of praise this off season. We talked about Evan Mobley getting just the highest of praises from guys like Kevin Durant to uh, you know, all these camps that he's been going to working with different coaches, legendary coaches who have worked with, you know, other all-stars in the past, but there's a guy and we we've talked about him. We've ripped on him and I am starting to freaking drink the Kool-Aid Brandon. I'm starting to drink the Kool-Aid. And it's more of a what if as opposed to a I believe it. But what if year three, and you've wrote about this, if you guys haven't checked out Brandon's article, go check it out and you'll know who I'm talking about in a second. What if Isaac Okoro in year three has a monster breakout year? A lot of pe- a lot of people have have been talking about him, the work he's been putting in, and how much different he looks. Working on becoming a three level scorer, his defense just getting better, learning to slash a lot more. He knows he can get to the rim. He's working on all the things that we have all that we have talked about, like a, like hitting the corner three more consistently, getting to the rim, being more aggressive on offense, because I think deep down, he knows there was a lot of games last year where he played 30 plus minutes and scored less than 10 points. And if he would have scored 10 points, they would have won the game. So if he's putting in all this work and hypothetically, he puts it all together and he's averaging 16 points a game, you know, seven boards, you know, five assists, maybe let's say three, two, three blocks, but you know, He's stealing the ball like crazy. This team is going to be a, just in, in, infinitely scary. I will put it this way. I'm, I'm going to put it in a different way. If Isaac Okoro becomes a, a poor man's version is kind of a bad word, but I'll say it like this. If he becomes a little bit of what Jimmy Butler was when he first started rising up, obviously, in Chicago mm-hmm. and then going to Minnesota and Philly and, and now what he is in Miami – but if Vacoro is what I've seen people compare him to, there was some comparison to Jimmy Butler when he first came out of the draft. Of course, mm-hmm. Jimmy Butler was a late first round pick by Chicago, and it took him a few years to watch him look where he is now. Yeah. If Okoro becomes that, the Cavs are right there with Milwaukee as the best team in the East. I I I yeah. I would say if you get that out of Okoro. Plus what you get with Garland, Mobley, Allen, Marketing, uh, Kevin Love, you know, Levert, Abaji, who we all expect to contribute th- this season. Those guys right there, and we haven't even talked about, you know, the bench step behind them with Rubio coming back. Those guys right there. And, and it goes back to, again, the sexted conversation. Like everything is linked back because if Okoro is that good, He's going to get the start at the two or yep. or the three. 
Yeah, I think I think probably if, the two you would think. Yeah, I'm thinking if a Coro, if a Coro's game and the we have talked about this and we've ripped on a Coro and it's not because I love I loved a Coro when they took that when they when they took him out of college when they drafted him I was thrilled that they took Isaac Coro. My thing with Okoro was I thought Isaac Okoro coming out of college was going to actually be Scotty Barnes last year. Okay. I thought he was going to come in and shock the NBA that his offense was better than at you know than they thought. Yeah. But it wasn't. His 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 specialty was defense. But you could see flashes last year. He had games where he put up 16 to 18 points. I mean, he did was, you remember the dunk when he dunked over three people in Houston? Well, well, I, we, we've talked about it. We've talked about all. I mean, that was, I mean, that was like, I mean, he had a bunch of ridiculously yeah. good dunks, but not only that, he seemed to be more comfortable shooting that corner three. Now, if he, you know, he can get to the rim, if he can hit that 15 footer, then if he can hit that, that corner three, he is, he is a three level score. If he can do it consistently and he's slashing to the rim on top of how good his defense is, you know, not everyone blooms into an all-star within their first year or their second year. Sometimes it takes, I mean, we've seen players who, who are in the league five, six years, and then they become somebody. A Jimmy Butler is an example. It took him, what, four or five years before he yeah. really became, you know, a star? I mean, Giannis, too, for, for the yeah, Bucks. It took, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, no one thought I mean, Giannis was the best player in the world, and now look at him. I'm, I'm, I will never compare a Coro to, to Giannis. But I think that we are we are hearing there is too much smoke for there to not be fire with this going on. There is no way that we are hearing he's going to all these camps. He's playing with all these all stars and he's looking like the best player on the floor. We've been hearing he's training with everybody that he could possibly train with. He knows he knows that this has to be a, a big year, but he's only 21 years old. He is, point. he is extremely young and he has, he, uh, he has two years experience in the NBA and we've seen the flashes of what he could become. If he could put that together on a consistent nightly basis, the Cavs team, this Cavs team would be just horrifying because he can guard one through three, but we can guard three through five. Jared Allen could guard four or five. Uh, Garland can guard one or two on top of the fact that, you know, then you, you know, does it even matter who plays small, you, small, right. the, your small forward position could be, if you need a, if you want to go a big lineup, you put in marketing, you want to go with a little bit of a smaller lineup. You could put in Levert right. or Agbaji, um, you, you know, coming off the bench. Like we've talked about, you have all these players, but a is a 21 year old player who is trying to put it all together. And if he is able to do that, I would rescind my argument from last or from last episode where we said, what is more important um, Garland or Mobley. And I would say if a Coro develops this year, he might be the biggest piece to this Cavs. Ooh, puzzle. I don't know if I would go that far yet. Um, but okay. I, if, okay, if go ahead. It, I'm just going to say that. We're expecting Mobley and Garland to be all stars, right? Yes, that's fair. okay. I think that I think Allen potentially will be an all star again. I think it's not going to be because of his play. I think it's just going to be because they're they're he's so others are going to get votes. Yeah. Um, but if Isaac Okoro plays at an all star level, we're already expecting Garland there. We're already expecting Mobley there. We're already expecting Allen there. If a Coral plays at an all-star level, would that not be something that we didn't expect? No, I I completely agree with and you. That I'm might that, put that yeah, and, and yeah, like you no. just, and you said if he comes out and plays like that, you might put them up there with the Bucks as the best yeah. team in the East. Yeah. And that, and you know, I have said since day one of this podcast, I, I know that he was, you know, first round pick. I know that, that you know, his offensive struggle. I know he's shown some flashes. My biggest thing with Akora was as great as his defense was, we saw it last year in the big games where teams were just double teaming Garland or whoever was the primary ball and or leaving Akora in that right corner and daring him to shoot the three. And my biggest thing is, 
in today's NBA, unless you are pretty much, you know, a dinosaur, big man center, walking shots right underneath the basket, you have to have some sort of a relevant shot because guys are just going to leave you open. And I don't care how great a defense you play. We've seen in the NBA, guys can play perfect defense with with their hand right in your grill. And a better shot sometimes will just beat better defense because shooters are so skilled. And the and the way the floor is spread today, it makes it a lot easier to score the basketball. Yeah. So I think. Isaac, now, in a way, because we're hearing all these reports of him working out with all these great stars, I would go as far as to say now, there is a little expectation for him going into the season. Like, show us, because it's it's all great. I could argue playing against the best players in camp and getting better every day is, is more valuable than playing in second or third string guys in a preseason game that probably aren't even going to make the roster. So yeah. if you put in the work and if you come in, you show us this, the Cavs, the, the sky is the limit to where this team could go. They're one of the deepest in the NBA. And if the breaks fall right and if a Coral breaks out, that team, is a team that nobody in the NBA is 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 going to want to deal with. I'm not putting them in the NBA championship yet. I'm not putting them in the stratosphere yet. You got to earn your keep. But come October, what would that be? October 23rd, Sunday, Rocket Mortgage Field as against the Washington Wizards, not the Charlotte Hornets. Um, and then obviously <laughs> uh, October 19th against the Toronto Raptors opening night in Toronto Cavs Raptors. I will have a full schedule breakdown later tonight on Believe Land Media, LLC.com. As always, make sure to check out all our great stuff. Joey filled in this week with Clarence Wilson on Den of the Dogs. Great episode as we were out to record this today. Another day where Browns news drops. We're not talking about that because we got the Cavs, which are the rising team in the city, along with our great Guardians, which are one of the most incredible innings I've ever watched in my uh, life last night. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. So, stay, stay in the first place. Yes, sir. Shout out to uh, Mel Kirby, Kevin Sledge for that, along with uh, the, the the Power Driver podcast with Mike Dean and the boys, all our great writers. We got a lot going on at Believe Win Media. And Joey, next week is episode 45 of ATC. I, I can't wait. G- going to come up with more stuff. Guys, if you want to hear us talk about anything, just let us know on Twitter, All Things Cavs Podcast. Uh, you can get me at goodfellow underscore Joey. Brandon, what's your, what's your Twitter? At Brandon Willis underscore seven. And I actually have a topic for you that I will throw once we get done at this. I think it'll be a fun topic. Oh, there I, we go. Can't I, wait. I, I found it very, very late last night as I was about to go to bed. So I said we 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 will save it for next week. I think I think it's actually a very fun topic. So a little tease there. Well, Brandon, uh, I think there's only one thing left to do, and I and think you know is what it is. To let oh no. Ah.